Have you ever wondered what's a good way to make changes to existing data transformations in Foundry? Or do you want to learn more about producing reliable data pipelines? In that case, you've come to the right place. Working with the platform over the past couple of years, I've discovered some common pitfalls to avoid and some best practices to adhere to in this development process. In today's video, I'd like to share with you my recommended flow of changing such data transformations in Foundry. Keep in mind that what I'm about to show you is certainly not a list of all best practices you could potentially follow, but it will definitely make your life much easier when working with data transformations in Foundry. This guide is definitely opinionated, and for some pieces there might be different opinions. I encourage everybody to comment based on what worked well for them and what maybe didn't. Finally, I will be using PySpark code in this video, but the concepts apply to other languages as well. So let's jump into the code. For the purpose of this video, let's assume I'm a data engineer, and my goal is to make changes to an existing data transformation. For this demo exercise specifically, I just want to rename a column. Once I attempt to do that here on master, you can see I'm unable to change the code directly and this is how it's supposed to be. The master branch should be protected, development should be done in separate branches. With Foundry, we can treat data like code and guarantee a stable production environment. Being able to rely on a stable master pipeline allows us to build business critical production applications with Foundry. Technically, we can achieve this by protecting the master branch. And you can see here, it is recommended to set up protection for a trusted branch like master. In general, I would recommend adding a group of approvers instead of a single person like I've done here for demo purposes. In order to do our work now, we're going to create a new branch. So we give it a descriptive name, prefixed with my name here, in this case, JRitter, rename average distance column. Because the thing we want to do here in this PR rename the average distance column into average distance for origin. So we go in here and type for origin and yeah, it looks good. And while making such changes, one should adhere to the PySpark style guide. I would recommend having a read through the style guide and try to apply these patterns for higher code quality. Higher quality of code and readability also means that it's less prone to bugs and can be understood and maintained in a better way by others in the future. Once you've made the changes you want to do and believe your code could work, the next step in the dev process is usually to test with preview. So we hit the button preview here and you can see it starts computation. And what's useful here is it doesn't run on the full input, which might be massive when processing big data, but preview only runs on a sample of 10,000 rows. It's important though to keep in mind the consequences of this sampling. Because only a subset of the input data is being used, you can expect kind of wrong values in certain cases, especially when you join datasets or compute aggregations. And what do I mean with that? Specifically here, we are doing an aggregation to compute the average distance and the number of flights per origin. Imagine though if the input has more than 10,000 rows. It means that, in the case of preview, not all rows are taken into account to compute these statistics. And thus, for example, the number of flights per origin you see in preview will be lower than the actual value in reality. It's important to keep this in mind and be aware that preview is great for, for example, quickly checking whether your syntax is fine, you're using the correct column names, or whether your transform generally produces reasonable values. But it cannot be used to determine whether the exact output values are 100% correct if the input is larger than 10,000 rows. There is a way to change the default sampling though. You can configure the input strategy and apply custom filters to use sampling for specific fields. So you can see here we click configure input strategy and select apply custom filters to the original input. Then we um, choose the origin column and type ORD to only filter to Chicago's airport. And 
uh, you can see it's also possible to save these filters such that you can reuse them later in future sessions. So let's apply that filter now and check out our input data, which is refreshing automatically. If we go to the origin column, we can see it only displays our ID by now. So based on our input strategy, and um, if we go to our output data set here, we can see it still has all of the data because we haven't run a preview in the meantime. So let's hit preview. And after that, we can see the output only contains one row for the ORD report. This is extremely useful for debugging certain cases during development. Let's say, for example, you want to investigate why a certain code path isn't working as expected. In that case, you can use a specific example by pre-filtering the input data set for your preview. In some cases of more complex code with several different data frames, you might also want to dive deeper into the content of these variables at several different steps in your code. This is exactly the purpose of the debugger. In this example, I'd say using the debugger is a bit of an overkill, but we'll do it for demonstration purposes anyway. As in other coding environments, you can set a breakpoint by clicking next to the line number. So let's do it here in line 10 and 18. And you can see the preview button has changed to preview and debug now. By clicking on it, you will see the debugger view. And uh, if you select the arrow next to the variable names here, for example, for source DF, you can see metadata like the schema and column names for the data frames, for example. If you'd like to view the content of a specific data frame at a specific line of code, we can also hit preview here. So let's do that. And note that the origin is still ORD for the entire input due to our input sampling we said previously. So let's return back to the debugger and look at the left panel where you can perform commonly known debugging operations like resuming execution, stepping over into or out, or stopping execution. Let's resume execution for now to jump to the next breakpoint. And also note that you can use the console to execute testing operations on your data frame. For example, you can run sourcedf.count here and it's going to return us 10,000 because that's the size of the input data set. Now, let's finish the execution of this. At this point, if you'd like to add one more level of resilience in the dev process, it's also possible to add unit tests. Especially if you've changed the logic in a transform, it's recommended to add a unit test for that. We have a full video on how to do that, which you can check out if you're interested in more detail. There's also a link in the description. Now, if you're confident with the code, the next step would be to commit your changes. And here there's a pre-filled commit message, but I always recommend entering a descriptive message because it will just be much easier to understand for you and also for others what was going on when reading the commit history later on. So we're going to put rename distance column to average distance for origin because that's what we're doing here. And then we're going to hit the blue commit button. The next step in this process is building your dataset on the branch, not just preview, but building the entire dataset. And there are two main recommended ways to build your dataset. The first option is, as I'm showing here, building from the code by hitting the build button. And when clicking build here, first the so-called checks will be run. And this verifies, for example, that our code makes sense syntactically and also makes sure all libraries are imported consistently and so on. Afterwards, the build runs and you can open the dataset as soon as it's done. The second option to build datasets is to build from data lineage, also known as monocle application. We can get there by hitting the explore lineage button on top. And if you want to build multiple datasets from different code files at once, you have to use monocle. An important pitfall here is you first need to wait for the checks to complete before building the dataset from Monocle. Otherwise, the old code will still be used. And this makes sense because you do not want to block the dataset from building just because you might currently be developing some code. It also ensures that if, for example, checks are broken for whatever reason, the datasets can still update. You can see that the checks haven't completed yet if there's the banner warning about the old job spec 
or if the code is not up to date yet. And once the checks do have completed, one can select the datasets in this view and then build them like this. So now let's return back to the code because there's one final hint I'd like to show you. I always recommend to replace paths with RIDs. And what do I mean by that? Each dataset in Foundry is uniquely identified by a so-called RID resource identifier. And there's a file which keeps track of a mapping between these RIDs and the fully qualified dataset paths that you might already know. You can view this file by hitting the cog wheel here on the left, then clicking on show hidden files and folders and opening the file called transformshrinkwrap.yaml. However, you can just avoid having to meddle with this file if you replace paths with RIDs. For that, let's go back to our transform and hit this corresponding button. And when we click on this, you can see it magically replaces these paths with RIDs and it also displays it nicely for us. This is going to make your life much easier, especially when datasets are moved around between different folders. And by using RIDs instead of paths, you can prevent many different kinds of issues with the shrink wrap file. For example, merge conflicts with other branches. Lastly, I'd like to share with you my main takeaways for the development process and software craftsmanship in Palantir Foundry. You should always protect your master branch and develop on non-master branches. Adhere to the PySpark style guide to produce high quality and less error-prone code. Next, use preview for fast iteration, but remember the sampling to 10,000 rows on the inputs. You can configure the sampling input strategy to debug specific cases, and if you want to go further, use the debugger for more complex code. Also, write descriptive commit messages that are going to help you understand better what was going on in your process. If you're building a dataset from the data lineage or monocle application, you first need to wait for the checks to complete. Otherwise, it's going to use the old code. And finally, whenever possible, you should try to replace dataset paths with RIDs. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, learned something, and most importantly, also had some fun. <laughs>